Welcome. We are beginning Revelation chapter 4. And today, as we go through, I'm not going to have us looking up a whole lot of Bible passages. That way we can move quicker. I will give you the references. And you can then listen to the tape later if you want the references, if you don't get them copied down fast enough. And then you can uh, look them up on your own. So we're going to start uh, with... Chapter 4, verse 1, after these things, now I'm going to stop. If we were dispensationals, they, we would be saying that after these things happened, the things in the seven churches, the next thing that happens in history, and then we have uh, chapter 4, and then the next thing that happens in history, and, and so forth and so on. That is a misunderstanding. What he means by after these things is after these things that I saw the next thing I saw was he's not saying after these things happened in history the next thing that happens in this chronological history of the earth so all those uh, uh, wh what's that series of books that was so popular left behind. the left behind yeah. books that's all uh, pure fiction yeah. it, it may be fun read I don't know but because I haven't read any but I did read uh, Tim LaHaye's Late Great Planet Earth, yeah. which was all the rage back in the 70s. And Tim LaHaye's book was based solidly on the information in the Schofield Reference yeah. Bible. And they have all of these uh, really uh, non-biblical ideas uh, taken, from the, uh, taken from the work of uh, Darby, uh, so uh, every time we see this and we'll see it uh, in uh, future chapters after these things all he's talking about is after I saw A then I saw B okay I looked see now he's looking <laughs> okay like I said and there was a door uh, that was standing open in heaven we were talking earlier before I turned on the tape about silly commentators and there are silly commentators who think that John is somehow an ancient Babylonian and thinks in terms of ancient Babylonian cosmology that had a hard dome on the earth and there were little doors that the Babylonian gods would open and let the rain come out or let the stars shine through, silly things like that. This is not what John means, okay? When he sees this door, a door is a natural way that we go from one place to another. And that's what he's talking about, because he's about to, in this vision, go to heaven. It might make you think of that passage uh, in uh, the book of Acts, where Paul says, we saw a door of opportunity open for us in Macedonia. Ooh. Nobody thinks that there was a door <laughs> there and that it had over the door the words Macedonia, yeah. and he <laughs> walked through the door, boom, there he was. Okay, it, it is a way to go from place point A to point B, and that's what we have here. Uh, open in heaven, uh, we already talked about heaven, the word heaven uh, could be translated sky also. Uh, the, the biblical cosmology seems to be something like this. There is air where birds fly and uh, people jump through it and that sort of stuff. And that's the first heaven, okay? Then there's the second heaven, and that's the place where you have stars and moon and comets and sun and all that that's the second heaven and then the third heaven would be where god lives the celestial domain if you will and so uh when he sees this uh you know you have to pick i guess which heaven you think because he happens to be going into the area where god is i assume he's talking about the third heaven what we would call the third heaven so when we see here uh, that he sees this door in heaven, what we should probably think of is an opening into God's domain. Okay? Uh, 
And I heard the first voice. This is the voice he heard in Revelation chapter 1, uh, sounding like a trumpet. And uh, we looked at this whole trumpet sound and the thrilling sound of a trumpet and how trumpets were used to sound battle cries and trumpets were used to call people to worship and to call people into an assembly. And all of that meaning comes back. And you can look at your notes from chapter 1 if you want to refresh yourself on that. But we have this whole sense of assembling and worship. And worship really comes through strong because of what we're going to find through in the rest of the chapter, where everybody's worshiping God. Uh, but also, you know, this is a, a call to arms in a way. Uh, and the voice is speaking, and how a trumpet can sound uh, like a voice speaking uh, just lets you know that this is a simile. Come up here, and I will show you what must happen after these things. Come up here, i.e. come through this door, and this would be an impossible task until we get down uh, to uh, verse 2, uh, where we find out how this becomes possible. So right now we're just going to say he's being invited up into heaven. Something that he can't do, but which the Spirit is going to enable him to do. And I will show you what must happen after these things. Uh, this is not a causal in the sense of uh, these are the things that God is going to cause to happen. But these are the things that must happen. I am holding this little uh, bag for my tape recorder or, or digital recorder, right? If I drop it, I mean, excuse me, if I let this go, what must happen? Did you make that fall? <laughs> no, you didn't, okay? That's how must is being used here. There is a reality in our world. It's the reality of sin, of the fall. It is the reality that there is a God, a just and righteous God. And because of these realities, certain things must happen. They are inevitable. We must die. Does that mean for the vast majority of the time, are we causing our own death? I mean, a few people maybe commit suicide, of course. But for the vast majority of us, no, we're not causing our death. But we still say we must die, right? Okay. So that's how must is being used here. Um, and uh, so these are things that must happen. And we will see, just in general, that uh, it is a response, or these things are things that um, deal with sin and salvation. And instantly, I came under the Spirit's power. Uh, and we have um, John being in the Spirit, uh, and... the. And he looks, and a throne is standing in heaven. So what happens here is the Holy Spirit makes this vision possible. And we have um, several other instances recorded in Scripture that are similar to this. For example, uh, pa Paul speaks about a vision that he received of, of the third heaven. Yet, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. So, the same would be here. Is this just something that John sees? Or does the Spirit actually physically transport him to heaven? We can't say for sure. But what we do know is that John is actually seeing this uh, in reality. And what we need to do is be careful not to add you know, like, uh, oh, oh, uh, you know, the, the silly new age ideas that have become popular, like, you know, my soul leaves my body and, and travels to Mars or Venus or something like that. Those are all uh, silly ideas. If your soul ever leaves your body, according to the Bible, you are dead. Okay? You know, we have... Uh, medical definitions and physical definitions of death, you know, like uh, your heart stops beating or you 
don't have any brain waves or something like that. Uh, biblically speaking, the definition is your soul has left your body. Okay. Um, so anyways, uh, moving along here. Um, uh, and look, a throne was standing in heaven. Again, not the first time we have seen the word throne. Throne always represents rule and authority. Here, it continues to represent rule and authority. Uh, uh, kingdom, if you will. And we are going to find that this is God the Father's throne. Uh, a throne was standing in heaven. So uh, somehow at this point, it's just sort of up there. There's no support, mm -hmm. which again would accent God Almighty, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, and someone was sitting on the throne. Now he doesn't tell us who that someone is right here, but we're going to find out that it is the Father. Uh, it is interesting that the Father is almost, well, as far as I know, never physically described in the Bible. Mm -hmm. His presence is there. He's an unapproachable light, stuff like that, but he is never given sort of an, uh, a, a bodily image, like Jesus is the Son of Man. He had a bodily image. Jesus gets baptized, and the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove. There's a physical image. But no physical image for the Father is there. Has driven artists crazy, mm -hmm. so they put hands there, you know, to represent the Father. Is, is, is he we are created in the image of God, but that would be the triune God. Okay? And therefore, this includes the Son. Okay? Um, and ultimately, the best def definition of being created in the image of God is original righteousness. We were pure, we were righteous, we were sinless, just like God. Um, and that's why we lost the image of God when we sinned or when Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, there is a broader understanding also that's okay with the image of God, which would include things like um, uh, intellect, creativity, that sort of stuff. But the thing that the Bible most emphatically identifies as the image of God is original righteousness, holiness, sinlessness, purity. Stuff that we struggle with now, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so there's one who sits on a throne. Uh, throne. Okay. And the one who sat there looked like a jasper stone and like a carnelian stone. And there was a rainbow around the throne, which looked like an emerald. Now, we color covered these stones last time. And... Uh, we talked about possible meaning based on the color. Uh, I don't know how much time I spent on the color red, but the carnelian stone is red. Uh, and I'm trying to remember, how much time did I spend on, on the color red? Or did I just really quick um, sort of brush over it? Well, uh, let me just uh, do some, uh, read some quick notes I have here that uh, might be of interest. I think they are. Uh, the Carnelian Stone or the Sardis Stone, we have a definite color, which is red. The word red appears 53 times in the King James Bible. The word reddish appears six times. The word scarlet appears 51 times. Every reference to reddish is in the book of Leviticus and our references to mildew on the skin or mildew or skin disease. 28 times the word red is in a reference to the Red Sea. Red is used once in reference to being drunk and that would be G Genesis 49:12 and three times in reference to wine, once uh, in Psalm 75:8, once in Proverbs 23:31 and once in Isaiah 27 verse 2. In my opinion, none of those passages help us. 
in getting an understanding here. So we don't need to look up any of them, okay? Red is used seven times in reference to material used in the tabernacle or in worship. The word scarlet is used 33 times in this fashion. Eleven times both red and scarlet refer to opulent clothing or decorations. Places like Esther 1, 6, 2 Samuel 1, 24, Proverbs 31, 21, Daniel 5, 7, and so forth and so on. If we take these worship equipment and rich clothing passages together, we have a staggering 51 references associated with splendor and glory. In Isaiah 1.18, both red and scarlet are the colors of sin. This is the only place in the Bible where red is associated with sin. So all of these commentators that say red is the color of sin hang it on this one passage alone and they ignore all of these other passages. Consequently, I don't agree with them. Um, and Isaiah, uh, uh, in Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, we find scarlet being associated with blood and redemption. If we include in this little study on red all the references to blood, which you know people think of as red, we would find a very so strong connection with the concept of redemption. Certainly the concept of redemption works a lot better when we're talking about God than sin. Okay. Red is also the color of fire, and we did a big study about fire back in Revelation 1-7. Uh, and uh, there are several other passages which are simply a reference to the color red. Uh, then we have some horses uh, in Zechariah 1-8 and 6-2 that are red. And we have, we'll talk about those when we get to the horses in Revelation. Okay. But if we put all of this together, uh, and, and there are a few other uh, passages, but if we uh, take it all kind of together, red begins to have the meaning of splendor and glory and the color of heavenly royalty and honor, and uh, as well as uh, worship and, and redemption. And it kind of complements the meaning of gemstones in general, which is glory and splendor so uh, if you give no meaning to the color red it doesn't really uh, hurt your understanding here but if you want to go with a color for it uh, it is the color of royalty so when we have the the whore of Babylon later on uh, riding around on this red beast right well she's pretending to be royalty and that's what the red is getting across. This was uh, uh, rich and so forth. Uh, okay? So anyways, now the main thing that we're going to get, and I think we also already talked about uh, the emerald and green uh, and rainbow. So this is going to be reflecting also rainbow reflects uh, God's promise. Throughout the Bible, uh, God keeps his promises. So here we have God uh, we have the three stones. Three is the number for God. And so that's going to be our primary understanding of these stones. He wants to reflect divinity. And three, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. On and on and on. <laughs> we have um, the number three being used in reference to divinity. Uh, so this is God the Father. Uh, who, and we're going to find that out for sure because God the Son and God the Holy Spirit makes his apparent, their appearance in just a little bit, leaving only the Father. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I think I'm going to just stop there for half a second and ask uh, any questions about, uh, about this so far. I'm, I'm trying to keep us moving here. Okay. Uh, so summing up these first couple of verses, uh, we would say uh, God the Father is glorious. He is the ruler of nature and all the living. He is also the God who remembers and keeps his promises. In light of what the book of Revelation reveals about the future, 
such an image of God is most comprehensive. Okay. Then uh, we'll move on to verse 4 as soon as I turn my page. And around the throne were 24 other thrones. Now, uh, I'm going to stop right here. We already have spoken about thrones and uh, meaning rule and authority and power and kingdom and that sort of stuff. The throne continues to have that meaning. Okay? But here there are 24, uh, and they are around the main throne. So what these thrones are, they are rule, they are power, they are authority, but they are a derived a power or a derived authority. It's uh, much like when I was a kid out in the street uh, playing football, flag football, and having a wonderful time, and my little sister would come out and say, it's time for dinner. Mm -hmm. And what did I do? I stopped playing football and came in. Not really because my sister told me, but because she had a derived authority. She had the authority of my mother, and if, if I told my little sister to go jump in a lake, she, I wouldn't be in trouble with her. I'd be in trouble with mom, okay? So this is the, the type of thrones that we have here. These 24 thrones are around in front of the throne of the Father, and the, he is the source of their authority. This brings a, um, up a, a theological truth, if you will. The Father is the source. We say in our creed that uh, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, we do know from the Bible that the Jesus was there, the Holy Spirit was there, but ultimately, the Father is the source. So we say... Uh, the only begotten Son of the Father. It's not that the Father is the only begotten Father of the Son. You know, the Son draws his source from the Father. The same is true of the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And, of course, the Son is begotten from the Father. So the Father remains the source, the creator. And uh, if you want more information about that, it is my humble opinion, after 30 plus years of studying theology very carefully, that it can't be explained. Okay, How can the Father be the source, and yet be the Son and the Spirit be co-equal and co-eternal? There is no good answer to that. Not, not <laughs> and you want a good answer, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you, you can you can ha develop a headache trying to come up with an answer that says the Father is the source, and yet there has never been a time that there was not a Son, and there's never been a time that there has not been a Holy Spirit. It is just how Scripture has chosen to reveal the Father to us, and we, uh, just like I was saying in Sunday's sermon, that we have to put ourselves under the scripture. Uh, and sometimes that brings about a headache because the scripture describes things that are impossible for us to make a good mathematical model out of. And you know, the obvious one is one plus one plus one equals one, you know, the Trinity. Uh, but we've been hearing about that ever since we were in catechism class. And so, uh, and, and that's not even a big secret to Lutherans. I mean, talk to a Methodist, talk to a Presbyterian, talk to a Roman Catholic. They all believe in the Trinity, at least ways that they are Orthodox Methodists and Presbyterians and so forth. Um, well, this is another one of those mysteries. The Bible tells us what the truth is, and the fact that we cannot grasp it it's because we are fallen sinners. And this is one of the consequences of not having that original righteousness anymore. Uh, and so we just accept that. And then we move back to our text now, after I did that little aside. And around the throne were 24 other thrones. 
Now, uh, we're going to find out that there are 24 elders on these thrones. In fact, it even says, on these thrones are 24 elders dressed in white garments. White is going to have the same idea. It's the heavenly color, purity, righteousness. So we're talking here, and we got garments. Uh, so what we're talking about here is the, uh, the righteousness of Christ, which has been put over them. The imputed righteousness of our Lord. It's an alien righteousness. It's not that their skins are white. It's not that, but that they are wearing white robes. Okay? And there were golden crowns on their heads. Those crowns, that's the Greek word Stephanos. It is the type of crown that the um, Greeks gave out to the victors in their athletic contests. So these are crowns of victory. Gold, again, represents uh, value and great worth. And if you look at all of the uses of gold in the book of Revelation, it becomes quite clear that gold is the color of heaven. You know, the streets are paved of gold, and, and gold's all over the place. Uh, it reminds me of this old joke. Uh, Joe has just been a saint. Absolute great guy his whole life. And it is about time for him to die. And because he has been such a great saint, God gives him a vision. He says, Joe, I'm going to make an exception for you. And I'm going to let you take anything you want from this earth into heaven. And so at first he thinks, well, gosh, I'm going to take money. And then he thinks about it and he goes, well, I don't know. I don't know how much value the American dollar is going to have <laughs> in heaven. He says, I'll take gems, and then he starts thinking about, you know, wait a minute, we got uh, uh, gems all over the place there, and he's go going through all these eyes ideas, and then finally he thinks, I'm going to take gold. I don't care where you go, gold has value. And so he shows up at the pearly gates, and he's carrying two bags full of gold, and Peter sees him and says, oh, wait a minute, Joe, you can't bring those earthly things here. And Joe says, I've got a special dispensation from God. He's letting me bring in something from earth. And so Peter checks it out. And sure enough, he's got permission to do that. And so Peter says, I'm curious. Exactly what did you bring? And Peter looks in the bag at all that gold. And he looks in and says, pavement. Why would you bring pavement? <laughs> pavement. You know, <laughs> why would you bring pavement to heaven? <laughs> you know, but that's just how common you might say gold is there. It is the heavenly color, the heavenly metal. And, um, you know, that's a long build up to make the point, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, there it is. Um, uh huh. I'm coming right to that right now. Okay, 24, uh, first off, uh, we should look at the word elders real quick. Elders are used, um, uh, the word is used quite a bit, uh, and we also uh, even use it today. Many churches have elders. Presbyterian is uh, from the Greek word presbyteros, which means elders. And a Presbyterian is a church that is ruled by the elders. Um, so uh, if we look around in the Bible, uh, the word Greek uh, translated elders is used a total of 69 times in the New Testament, 12 times in the book of Revelation. In the non-Revelation passages, it is used 29 times in reference to the leaders of the Jews. And all those references are in the Gospels or the book of Acts. Three times the word is used in reference to traditions or teachings handed down from former leaders of the Jewish people. Sixteen times it is a reference to pastors. Places like Acts 11.30, 1 Timothy 4.14, uh, James 5.14, and so forth. Twice it is a reference to the apostle John, and that is in uh, 2 John and 3 John. The remaining few passages typically refer to someone who is older. I mean, literally an elder, okay? Uh, 
A quick count shows that a staggering 50 of the 57 non-revelation appearances of this word are a reference to the leaders of God's people. The 24 elders then represent the leaders of God's people, the word elders. Now we go to the number 24. 24 is simply a doubling of the number 12. If we remember way back when we started and we took a look at numbers, we found that 12 was the number of uh, the people of God. So we have 12 and 12. Now, how many tribes were there in the Old Testament? 12. And how many apostles were there? 12. 12. So we have the people of God, Old Testament, and New Testament. And that is why there are 24 elders, and that is why uh, we think of them, or I think of them, so in terms of... Was Paul one of the apostles? Okay, uh, good question, and the answer is yes and no, okay? Paul is an apostle, but because um, we... Uh, oh, sometimes uh, the actual number of people is not important uh, when you're making a reference to something. For example, a legion, in theory, I think was a thousand men, but but uh, actually it depends on when you were in history. Uh, sometimes legions were as small as six hundred men. So, uh, but the name changed. Uh, so we had 12 apostles, even, and, and they were called the 12 apostles, even when uh, Judas died, and there were really 11. Right. And then they added Matthias, so they're back up to 12. And then they added St. Paul, so they're back up to 13, a baker's dozen. But they were all still called the 12. Okay. okay. So Paul didn't bump Matthias. Correct. Okay. Uh, Paul didn't bump Matthias. Or any of the other ones. Okay. I mean, yeah. when we think about it, we really uh, don't know a whole lot about most right. of the apostles. Right. Uh, and uh, so Paul not only does not bump Matthias, but he doesn't bump Thaddeus, for example. Mm -hmm. What did Thaddeus do? What, I mean, we have traditions, but in the Bible, you know. He had a very strong knee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, now when we look at these elders, and I said they represent the leaders, and they do, you know, the pastors and the bishops and the presidents and all that sort of stuff, but then again, the leaders always represent uh, those that they lead. Can't be much of a leader if you have nobody following, shall we say. So, in a further extension of the thought, it represents the church. Um, just like uh, uh, President Obama and now President Trump represents America. Uh, that's almost a schizophrenic picture of America, but nonetheless, they represent us or represented us to the world. And whatever they did, people in India or the Congo or England or whatever, they thought of you and me as having that attitude. You know? um, okay. So I think uh, that takes care of verse 4, correct? And mm -hmm. we're just moving right along here. And from the throne came, okay, now this is coming from the throne, so it's coming from God, uh, flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder and seven flaming torches were burning in front of the throne and these are the seven spirits of God. Now, uh, what we have here is reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is proceeding from the Father just like we confess in the creeds, right? Seven is the number that represents God's interaction with the earth. 
oftentimes in a evaluative fashion. That is, he's passing judgment. Thumbs up or thumbs down, so to speak. Uh, so, uh, and that's why we say it has seven here to represent that this is how God interacts with the world. God interacts through his Holy Spirit. He interacts. It is the Spirit who works through the Word of God. It is Spirit who works through the waters of baptism. It is the Spirit that works through the, the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. It is the Spirit who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, as we say in Luther's small catechism for the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Um, we have flashes of lightning and uh, rumbles and peals of thunders. Now we have, this is an image, uh, a divine theophany in many places. What is happening on Mount Sinai that has all the people running for cover? You know, we have all this lightning, we have this thunder covering the mountain, and people are, are scared to death. We have the flood, and then you have, you know, the lightning and the thunder, and in that case, rain and so forth. Uh, when, uh, okay, Elijah prop, uh, against the prophets of Baal, right? And what happens to Elijah's sacrifice? God makes his presence felt. Fire came down from heaven. Now, what does that mean? Uh, maybe it was a bolt of, of fire. I tend to think of uh, lightning, which is essence, is like fire, right? But uh, you can think of it as just pure fire also. But we have all this lightning and rumblings uh, and peals of thunder. So this is a, a theophany or a, a depiction of God the Father. Again, what as I said before, we don't really get a lot of images of, of the Father. What we see is that the Father controls the most powerful things we know of. So how do you accent that God is almighty? Lightning, thunder, all this stuff, you know, they are in his service. If uh, God was giving us a vision, it would probably be atomic explosions or, or whatever, that he is the master of those things. You know, they, they are just his lesser servants. And you think about that, that, that really accents your power, you know. Um, so uh, uh, we have the same uh, seven flaming torches. That would also uh, turn our minds back to the opening chapter where uh, you had the uh, churches represented by those uh, candlesticks and fire and flames and so forth. Um, and, uh, and again, everything and coming, you know, I, we already spoke about the Father as the source, and here we have the Holy Spirit proceeding from the, from the Father. Okay, um, and in front of the throne, okay, we're going to get on to Jesus here. We have the Holy Spirit. Uh, one other thing I'll point out real quick, we had the Father, Spirit, and then starting with verse 6, we're going to have the Son. Uh, this accents the co-equality between the uh, three persons of the Godhead. You don't have to say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Here we're going Father, Spirit, Son. Uh, also, Son is probably uh, coming in last because in this particular case, he's going to be taking uh, center stage, so to speak. Uh, okay, we still got time. Okay, in front, uh, any questions so far? I know I'm moving fast, and if, if people want me to slow down, I can. But... Uh, uh, I said last week that I want to get at least a half a chapter done each time, and, and so I have to kind of rattle on. And in front of the throne, there was also something like a sea of glass. Oh, oh excuse me, we're not going to get to uh, the sun just yet, but we will. And in front of the throne, was uh, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center, near the throne, and around the throne, there were four living creatures 
covered with eyes in front and in back. Okay, um, I know that crystal clear glass is as common as dirt today, but it was as rare an item as, uh, as diamonds in the ancient world. In fact, rarer. They, they could have uh, cloudy glass, but they didn't have clear glass. And so something like very clear glass was very, very precious. As, as precious as any of these other stones that we have talked about, as precious as gold that we've talked about. Um, and in front of the throne, uh, uh, again, uh, derived, uh, there was something like a sea of glass. Now, uh, again, I put no stock in those who take the image here from Babylonian mythology. In the Babylonian mythology, there is uh, this struggle uh, between two mythological uh, so-called deities, and one of them is chaos that rules the ocean. And uh, this is said. Th this strange thinking is also brought in to the creation stories in Genesis one and two, and. It's, it's not even on John's radar here. It's not even on uh, God's radar. We have more than enough uh, examples of sea in the Bible to find plenty of, of uh, meaning for it, shall we say. Um, we have, of course, uh, the Red Sea. We have the Mediterranean Sea, which was called the Great Sea. We have... Um, the Sea of Galilee, we have the flood, so there's lots of seas out there. The, um, the idea uh, can be, well, you know, a lot, what, what I, what I want to say here, I think it, it's just, um, we need to look at what you're seeing. In front of the throne, there was some, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, okay? Uh, so the, the ideas about uh, turmoil, trials, tribulations, which water definitely can mean, okay? You know, uh, we have Psalms talking about uh, being uh, like your, your troubles are like floods that are coming up and so forth. So it can definitely mean that. And certainly the idea of the flood gave birth to a whole lot of ideas of the dangers of the sea and so forth. But I think the best source for this idea of the sea comes actually from the worship life of the Israelites. In uh, the tabernacle and then in Solomon's temple, there was this huge basin. I mean, the thing was gargantuous. And they called it a sea. And the priests would ceremonially wash themselves every time they were to go into their service. So now uh, we have, a, and this would be a cleansing. And then that brings into mind baptism, which this uh, giant sea in the tabernacle and in the temple also foreshadowed baptizing. So we enter into the presence of God through the waters of baptism. Crystal clear, we are made righteous in the eyes of God. Great value, great worth. So that's kind of how I would go uh, with that, uh, that C. And in the center, near the throne, and around the throne, there were four living creatures. So again, they're around the throne, they're in the center. Uh, so again, they are a, uh, a derived sort of thing. Uh, there are four living creatures. Four is the standard number for world, earth, humanity, uh, and that sort of stuff. Uh, now these aren't humans, okay, but it's the, it's the standard number for the world and so forth. So we would expect these to somehow relate to the earth, to the world. And uh, 
they were covered with eyes in front and in back. You see things with your eyes, okay? And we uh, see that sort of uh, imagery in scriptures again. Uh, so these uh, creatures, in some sense, uh, are sharing the vision of God. They're seeing what's going on. And we're going to continue to get a description of these creatures. And we talked about these a bit last time. And uh, that's when I, I shared with you my feeling that these are cherubs, you know. And if you read this and you think about uh, the little chubby guy with a bow and arrow, you can see very little similarity, if anything at all. If you saw one of these things coming down the street, uh, you would be wise to turn the other way and run. Uh, unless, of course, uh, you knew that they were friendly and, you know, had a positive disposition towards you. Uh, and uh, we had all sorts of images. These, is, these are a, a well-known sort of uh, uh, celestial creatures in the ancient world world. And we really don't have time to speak about the symbolism in each of them, uh, or even touch on them lightly. Uh, so what we will do is uh, pick up at verse 7 next time. All I will say here is references to Roman uh, imperial rule where things like the eagle and so forth are just plain out of place, okay? Uh, and I'm sure by now you are well aware of the fact that I do not consider this book a coded anti-Roman tract, which is another silly idea by modern commentators, but they can write so eloquently that people buy into it without really thinking about it. If it was a coded anti-Roman Empire tract, of what value is it after the year 500? You know, why did we keep it around? <laughs> okay. Any questions about what we did through verse 6? I want you to know I got half the chapter done. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, we'll meet next time. Uh, same bad time, same bad station. If you like the pace, we can keep up this pace. If you want me to slow down, if you want me to speed up, I can't. This is about as fast as I can go. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, let us then uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.